Last time on object-oriented programming, we looked at inheritance, how we could build one class and declare that it is like another class, therefore inheriting its attributes and methods. That's clearly pretty cool, right? It allows us to scale up our program. But today, we'll take a closer look at what it really entails for us. More on this on this episode of Object-Oriented Programming. Hello and welcome back to Object-Oriented Programming. Now, today's video is sort of piecewise, right? It's sort of split into a couple of different, not really related bits, but they're all related to inheritance. So yeah, basically we're just going to call this more inheritance magic and we'll just look at them individually. The first cool thing we can do with inheritance is this thing called polymorphism. Now, polymorphism is something that is, I think, more clear in languages like Java, because as it turns out, we are suddenly a little bit more lax about the types. For this, I'm just going to demonstrate it to you and hopefully you'll see its power. So just as a reminder of where we've left off, previously we've built a ball class, right? It has a couple of attributes, it has a couple of methods. On top of that, we have built a golf ball class, which uses inheritance to, well, basically say it's like a ball, but it changes some things. Now, I've also taken the liberty of adding another class called the Bowling Ball class. Again, this class uses inheritance, right? So um, it's like a ball, but it does some things differently again. So this is where we're going to start off. We've also seen under inheritance that we can treat a golf ball like a ball. So based off of that premise, let's say in this scenario, we want to have a collection of ball objects. In fact, let's store that in an array. Now. Let's just say we have three of them, right? Let's keep things simple. Now remember, we can store a golf ball object in a variable of type ball, right? Because you can treat a child class as its parent. What this means is it's perfectly okay to actually create, you know, an item in our array that has one of the child classes. Now, if I remember correctly, a golf ball should only take in the color. So let's go ahead and do that. What I've done is I've created an array of type ball, but I've put a golf ball inside it. And you'll find that that works just fine. So if I go ahead and compile this, you will see that Java doesn't complain. In fact, I can mix and match types in the same array. So what I'm going to do is very quickly here, I'm going to change it up so that every one of these types have a representation within this array. So, um, well, this one is a weight for the bowling ball. And for the ball itself, we're just going to well, do something simple. All right. So now what we have are three different types stored within the same array. And again, if I were to pop over here, you will see that no complaints from Java. Everything is just fine. Now, let's do something else. Let's write a loop. And within this loop, we're going to go ahead and visit every single ball within that array. Now recall that our ball class has a function called display. This function will just tell us some things about the ball itself. And just to make things look a little bit neater, I'm going to inject a new line at the end of every display. Let's go ahead and compile this and run the program. As you can see, that's perfectly fine. These match the values that we've given. So what this means is Java will happily treat all of these three balls as the same parent type and it will just run the function and do the thing it's supposed to do. So that's cool, right? So we can treat everything as the same type. But let's take this one step further. Instead of trying to read out the values, now let's perform the kick function. Again, it compiles just fine and we can look at it. Now, here's something interesting. Remember, each one of the classes implements kick differently. And as you can see, that has indeed happened here. Our golf ball has moved forward by 7, our bowling ball by 1, and our normal ball by 3. So all this is code you've seen, right? For the bowling ball one, the code is here, right? It's changed to 1. So what does this tell us? This tells us that despite the fact that we treat all of these items as the ball class, and we run the kick function without even considering which type it is, the right thing still happens. 
That, ladies and gentlemen, is polymorphism. That's why it's so powerful. The same function will create the correct action. So we don't have to care exactly which child class it is. It just works. This can allow you to write code that is very dynamic and, you know, code that is not so tightly coupled with the actual type of the class. So yeah, this is one of the very powerful things that inheritance brings us. And there you go. Essentially, polymorphism means we can treat a class as its parent class. And we can even group them all together and they will still work in the correct way. So yeah, that's pretty powerful. So that's that. Our next two concepts involve inheritance still, but it now involves the concept of writing essentially an incomplete class. Now, you see, up to this point, uh, most of the things we've been talking about are real things, right? Ball is a physical thing, a bowling ball, a golf ball, those are definitely physical things. But sometimes what we want to do is we want to talk about something in the abstract sense. Because of this, we're not really able to define all the functions yet. All we have to say is that, well, we have a general class that is so general that some things are sort of undefined. But what you can do is you can inherit from it into a specific type and then implement those rules. Let's take a look at an example for an abstract class. So for this demonstration, we will be using a brand new class. I think it's a little bit easier to see with a different example. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's say I'm building a car class now. So, well, the car has a couple of attributes. Um, there's a constructor there. It can do, you know, some methods. Now I'm about to implement the drive function before I realize that, hey, you know what? That doesn't really work. You see, this car class is a general class, right? It's the, you know, just the concept of what a car is. When we actually use inheritance to, well, build specific cars, that's the only time in which we can think about how drive works. So what that means is, well, the abstract concept of a car cannot be driven, right? In fact, it shouldn't even be instantiated because that doesn't make any sense. And yet, I cannot leave out this function. If I do that, then I can't, you know, harness the power of polymorphism as we've seen earlier, right? I can't have an array of cars and say, I want to drive each one. The reason for that being, well, we have to treat those cars as the car type. And if I left this out, right, there isn't a drive function under the car class. So yeah, I need to have this, yet I can't write this. So that puts me in a little bit of a strange position. Luckily, there is something I can do in Java. I can say this class isn't a class that's supposed to be instantiated. It's meant to be a template for us to build new classes out of. So I say this is an abstract class. Java will then understand that this entire class is not meant to be instantiated. With this, I can now say something like this. I can say this function is an abstract function and I am not going to say how it actually works here. Now, this looks a little bit strange perhaps, but I assure you that it works. Let's go ahead and attempt to compile this. Okay, fine, there's the bug here. Let me just fix that real quick. That now it compiles just fine, all right? So yeah, that was a typo. Anyway, the whole point is, abstract classes tell Java that, hey, I'm just not going to finish coding this class. Of course, what that means is if I try to build a car C equals the new car, yeah, that's not going to work, okay? So if we try to compile this, there's an error because car is abstract. It cannot be instantiated. So yeah, Java has pretty interesting syntax to basically, you know, create abstract classes like this. Which means, of course, that I am forced to perform inheritance if I want to actually use this class. So let's build that real quick. My car extends car. Of course, per inheritance rules, I can harness whatever is already here. But because there is an abstract function here, I must implement it. Now, let's try. Let's go ahead and uh, build the car class itself, right? And I'm going to make it look as similar to what we have previously as possible, right? So I'm going to just link the value through and let's just say I don't do anything else. I say my car C equals the new my car. Now this guy is in an abstract class, so I should be able to instantiate it. However, I am missing the implementation of this function, so there will still be an error. Let's take a look. See, my car is not abstract. 
and does not overwrite an abstract method. So what Java is saying is that abstract methods are allowed to exist, but only inside abstract classes. Remember, this guy acts as a template. This guy says, I want to use that template. So I have to implement everything. Since these guys are implemented for me, they can stay, but I am forced to implement this function. So let's go ahead and build this function, public void drive. And uh, well, let's keep this simple, right? I'm not actually gonna, you know, implement how an engine works. So I'm just gonna say, vroom, let's do that. Okay, so let's drive it. Now, with the exact same code here, let's try and compile this again. So I can go ahead and compile it, right? It works just fine. And if I attempt to use any of the functions here, well, that will work just fine as well. Provided, of course, I spell it correctly. There you go. All right. So that is an abstract class. I'll zoom out and let you see everything on screen. So yeah, that's an abstract class in a nutshell, a template that others can inherit from. And yet we can still have properties like this, right? We can still treat C as a type car. Like so, right? See, that compiles just fine. Right, so that's the power of abstract classes. Now, on top of abstract classes, Java also provides another feature called an interface. This one is a little bit different because an interface cannot contain any implementation like what we have here. As it turns out, an interface can only specify a set of abstract methods that whatever that implements it must implement. So let's take a look at this, right? If we were to convert the car example to that, quite a few things need to be changed. Let's first write the car abstract class as an interface instead. So I'll leave this here so I can copy from it, but at the end of the day, I will have to actually remove it. So interface car must have a public void accelerate function and must have a public void drive function. This is all I need to say in my interface. Now, the reason why I'm keeping this around is because, well, most of the things no longer live inside the interface. So I need to go ahead and move those over to the car itself. So yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Right. We now have our constructor here. We now have accelerate here and we can get rid of the abstract class. One last thing we need to change here instead of extends, it is now implements. Let's try and compile this and see what happens. So we head over to our command line here. All right, that works just fine. So what we're trying to say again, right? If we're to run it, right? We should see no runtime errors as well. Of course, no output because we didn't actually display any output, but that's not a key point. You see, an interface only says what kind of functions, right? What kind of public facing interface your class needs to implement. However, this guy down here, right, still works. We can still treat an object as its interface. So the easiest way to think of an interface is to think of it as an abstract class, except a little bit more strict in terms of what it can provide. An abstract class can have everything a class can have. However, an interface is just a list of methods, just a list of functions that you can actually use. You implement an interface instead of extending it, and yet, yeah, the only key thing you need to have is that, well, you need to specify all the functions that it specifies. So anything that implements car can be treated as a car. And well, we have the assurance that it will have the accelerate and drive functions. That is the idea. So I know that was quite a fair bit of information. So let's have a very quick summary. The idea is this for our abstract classes and interfaces, it is no longer compulsory to actually well implement our methods. The reason being, these are not meant to be instantiated. They're not classes that can be turned into objects. Instead, they only serve as templates for building actual classes. Of course, when it comes to an actual class, you have to implement all the methods, and that's why it can be instantiated. The keyword to use for abstract classes is extends because it essentially is inheritance. Whereas for interfaces, it has to be implements because you're just implementing an interface. Now, here's something extra that I didn't really talk about previously, and that is in Java, multiple inheritance is not possible. That is a class cannot inherit from more than one class. 
Multiple inheritance is kind of a can of worms, it is manageable if you have everything planned out well. But Java just says, no, we're not even gonna let you open said can, but some other languages do indeed allow you to do that. For interfaces though, you can. Because an interface doesn't specify any implementations, there isn't any ambiguity in terms of choosing which implementation is possible. At the end of the day, you just go ahead and implement the functions by name. So, a class is allowed to implement as many interfaces as it likes. Of course, the more interfaces you implement, the more rules you are bound by. So yeah, there is a you know, pros and cons of doing that. So that, ladies and gentlemen, are abstract classes and interfaces in a nutshell. Of course, the question is why? Why do we want to do this? Well, part of the reason is just because we want some kind of order. We want some kind of rules as we are modeling our problem. Sometimes what happens is that we want to set out some of these rules even before we can actually, well, define an actual usable object. That's where abstract classes and interfaces come into play. Essentially what we're saying is that if you want to be classified as type X, then you need to have all these properties. Later on, it's up to you to say, well, whether you want a class to conform to these rules or not. The reason why we want this in place is because at the end of the day, we can do polymorphism again. Yes, polymorphism comes back into the discussion. If I set out a bunch of rules and you follow them to create a class, this guarantees to me that I can interact with your class in a consistent, reliable way. I know what I can give it, I know how it's going to respond without any knowledge of how you've actually built it. That's the beauty of OOP. That's where the abstraction part really comes into play because I don't really care how you do things. I just know how it's meant to work and I can already use the class you've built. So yeah, that's why it's important to at least have an idea of how abstract classes and interfaces actually work. Now, unfortunately, this is a feature that's not present in some languages that give you access to OOP. In fact, most of the terms I've used are Java terms, right? Different uh, programming languages might use slightly different terminology, but the idea remains the same. Because polymorphism can happen, I can set out some rules and essentially have a reliable and consistent understanding of the world around me. That's all there is for this particular episode. Um, I hope this video wasn't too piecewise for you, and hopefully we've brought it together to a good conclusion. Again, that's it. We're not quite done with inheritance yet. Uh, next time, we'll talk about some similar concepts. But yeah, until next time, you're watching 0612TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.